When I was doing uh, social work, I worked primarily in the field of trauma. And it was from a, I would call a traumatic experience in my own life that uh, led me to that journey in social work to work with people who have been through trauma. And uh, I was seeing someone, a therapist at that time, who told me that this trauma will be a gift in your life. And I said that, I said, no way. <laughs> It will never, I'll never consider it to be a gift. Um, today I consider it a gift. Uh, not in the traditional way where I'm happy, ha, 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 about it, but I have mined it for uh, a depth of experience and of meaning and purpose, uh, which really brought me to this day. Um, when I went to massage school, I had one goal, and that was I had done some work in hospice as a massage therapist and, or as a social worker. And I wanted to retire from my day job and do volunteer work for hospice as a massage therapist. And that was the sole intention of what I wanted to do. And uh, I did retire, and I started to do volunteer massages for hospice. And uh, that led me into a type of therapy, which I'll get into in a little bit, uh, that is gentle, non-invasive touch. And it addresses pain at a different level. Uh, as a massage therapist, a lot of therapists will do deep tissue. And as you well know, that's contraindicated for persons with neuropathy. And uh, I also learned that uh, doing some fluid movement helps with that as well. So I took a course last um, November from Tracy Walton, who teaches oncology massage. And uh, Jerry was there and invited us to become volunteers for Oncology Massage Alliance. So that's why I wore the shirt I did. That's why I'm here as a volunteer with Oncology Massage Alliance. So. Uh, I'm going to begin. Two people that I credit in here are uh, Tracy Walton with Oncology Massage Therapy, caring for clients with cancer, uh, since I drew heavily from her book. And then also um, James Frickton, uh, Preventing Chronic Pain, a Human Systems Approach. And uh, we'll be going through some of what he talked about in a course I took online through Coursera. He is with the University of Minnesota, and he uh, has a human, what he calls a human systems approach to the management <coughs> of chronic pain. So uh, those are the two that I credit with this. So the definition of massage therapy is that it involves the manipulation of soft tissue structures of the body to prevent and alleviate pain, discomfort, muscle spasms, and stress, and to promote health and wellness. Uh, the American Massage Therapy Association defines massage as a manual soft tissue manipulation that includes holding, causing, movement, and or applying pressure to the body. So uh, massage therapy as a profession applies those manual techniques and may apply adjunctive therapies. The two adjunctive therapies that I work with um, and have training in is craniosacral therapy, along with massage, and lymphatic drainage. Uh, those two uh, are the ones that I'm skilled in using along with massage therapy. The, uh, it improves the functioning not only of muscles, but of lymphatic, circulatory, that's the blood, musculoskeletal, and nervous systems and may improve the rate at which the body recovers from injury and illness. Massage involves holding, causing movement of soft tissue and or applying pressure to the body. So those are the definitions of massage. I went online and watched a lot of the uh, videos that uh, for, and the slideshows for on uh, Neurology Alliance of Texas and so I, I won't bore you with the definition of neuropathy. Uh, your definition is much more palpable 
and you are the experts in what you experience. Um, and respecting that is part of what a therapist brings to the experience, rather than my attempting to uh, place on you something, it's more being with you in your experience of your neuropathy. And in that, maybe holding's indicated. There's no manipulation of the soft tissue other than just to support it. And in that, to uh, experience what that feels like. Um, so, Definition of neuropathy is a condition that disrupts the function of one or more peripheral nerves, causing um, changes in sensation and or motor function. The term typically describes the disease or injury of one or more spinal nerves serving the hands, feet, or both. It can also affect the special senses of internal organs. So, um, can be caused by many uh, reasons and some, we have some here that have been mentioned. So the signs, what we want to talk about are how it affects the periphery, the arms and the legs and the feet. There is, I've experienced with uh, patients that I've treated, visceral uh, pain as well. And so addressing that is a little different along the central nervous system. And there are nerves that correspond to that visceral pain. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate mainly on the peripheral nerves and if we afterwards want to talk about some of the uh, more visceral, uh, we can talk about that. But it's a feeling of pins and needles, slight pain, um, often a burning quality, and gets worse at night. People with neuro neuropathic sensation loss often describe it as having thin gloves or socks that interfere with their sensation, and also motor weakness can occur. How about you? How do you experience your neuropathy? What are the sensations or lack thereof that you have? Just like that. Just like that? Numbness. Numbness. Yeah. So there's a numbing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see some nods. Sometimes it's sharp pain. Sometimes it's sharp pain, mm -hmm. okay. Where is it located? Mostly? In my feet. In your feet, okay. And because uh, I can't feel my feet, I have problems with balance. Okay. And is it a constant pain or is it a sharp and then it goes up? There's a constant pressure in, in the feet, okay. almost like you're encased in cement. Okay. The feet don't move very well. And the uh, sharp pain comes occasionally, usually when I get emotional. Uh, okay. It was to start my feet going, and I was uh, earlier. I was saying how it's so sharp, and I tried to relieve that pain by jabbing it with a pen or a knife or something that's going to get in there to kind of turn it off. When or, you do that, do you feel that when you're poking? No, I don't feel that. I feel it where sometimes where the pain is, but not on the skin and not on, on the top. And sometimes I'll go out and walk on, we have crushed granite uh, in the backyard, and I'll walk on that barefoot, trying to get it to yes. kind of massage my feet. Okay. And that hurts, but it feels better than the pain I'm having. Okay. So. Good. Anyone else? Yes. I have a hypersensitivity all the time. They call it hyper, there's another name for okay. it, where it's the opposite. We're constantly feeling something going. Like it's through. amped up. Yeah, and then I, I, I feel that there's like a huge tumor there, and I go, there's nothing there. My feet are just normal, but it feels like I'm walking on a tumor of some kind with all this electrical sensations going through. And the socks keep me from touching, the toes touching, toes so it lessens that other. constant. How about having a blanket over your feet? Oh, just to touch on the yeah. tips. Can be that sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyone else? I have a. Go yes. Ahead. Go ahead. My husband worked with massages deeply when I broke his back. And he said my right foot feels a lot more stiff than my left foot. It's the right foot that I have. 
Okay, so it, when he rubs it, he senses a difference in the tone of the muscle. Okay, yes. I would say a sudden and kind of sharp pain, but it's a very specific to an area. And again, mine's a surgically induced, and it's the L5 nerve root, and I feel it, and it moves. The area that gets a sharp pain yep. moves around on the top of my forefoot. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. The um, let's go to the next. There are five questions that we're going to go through and ask um, in developing a massage plan for neuropathy. It's recommended to ask five questions and to follow two principles in the practice of giving and receiving massage therapy with neuropathy. The five questions, first one is, where do you experience the neuropathy? And we've had some specific references to toes and to the upper part of the foot. How does your neuropathy affect you? How is your neuropathy affecting you today? Those are different questions. On any given day, it may differ and change, and a massage plan has to account for that change today from what it was last week. And so uh, we'll go over that. The third is what is the cause of your neuropathy um, from a medical point of view? And then fourth question is what is the condition of your skin in the area of neuropathy? Is there any sensation? Is, it, uh, is there a break in the integrity of the skin? And then fifth, how is your neuropathy treated? And how does that treatment affect you? The two principles that guide us in developing a massage plan for neuropathy is the sensation principle. And that states, in an area of impaired or absent sensation, use caution with pressure and joint movement. So with the movement of joints, there is um, a, and a loss of sensation, uh, you want, a massage therapist wants to be careful with that movement of, of the joint and the pressure on the muscles. Um, so massage therapists follow that wherever sensation is compromised. The second one is sensation lost and injury prone principle and that says if a client has lost sensation in an area, look at, inspect the tissues carefully for injury before you begin massaging that area. And if there's a lack of integrity to the skin, uh, breakdown, um, make modifications. It may be necessary to bring the massage away from the area and holding a different part of the body up further up the neurological track. And so uh, we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later. So the first question, where is your neuropathy? And where do you experience it? L4, L5. Um, we'll go down to, in the bottom here, these lumbar nerves. At L2, there is what's called the calda equina, and it flattens out the nerves and they go through the sacral bone. And the feeling, the sensation all through the legs originates in that lumbar, lumbar area. Now, up in the cervical area, there is a whole different nerve complex that affects the arms, both in front and in back. Does anybody have pain in their arms or their hands? Is that right? Okay. Minor compared to the feet. Minor <coughs> compared to the feet. The migration is from the feet to the hands. Okay. Consider this uh, like a landscape for the nerve paths. There's branching of the nerves all the way down to very minor fibers of nerve uh, endings in the fingers and the toes. So there's, it's a tree, and if you think of a tree branching, it extends all the way out to the edge of the leaf. So addressing something at the level of the leaf can travel back up to the nerve path and help settle and relax down all the way up to the trunk of the tree. I have a question. Yes. Can neuropathy affect the bladder? It can. Yeah, that's what we're talking about with uh, visceral. 
kind of neuropathy? Visceral. Visceral. The viscera in the abdomen, all the organs and things. My doctor is giving me PTMS shots okay. in the foot once a month, trying to see if the wake up the nerves that go up there. Yeah. Is that going to work? I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but uh, I would I would have you consult with your doctor about how that may help you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go to the brachial plexus and the cervical plexus, which is in the neck. Um, this one, in, I'll talk about craniosacral therapy here. Craniosacral therapy begins with the five lateral diaphragms at the hip, the lower abdomen, which is the breathing out mechanism of breath and letting someone get a deep breath out the thoracic inlet, which is here, I don't want to, um, right here, and this thoracic inlet, there are some nerves, the stellate nerve is right here, the nerves, sympathetic nerves that help the breathing to relax are located here, and so this brachial plexus, especially in the phrenic uh, nerve, go down from here into here. So shortness of breath with pain, we catch our breath. When we experience that sharp pain, and that if it's ongoing, we may be in a chronic state of hypertension where we've caught our breath and our, our breathing has slowed down and gotten shallower and shallower. And, and we think if I breathe shallow, it won't hurt. And so in craniosacral therapy, I, I do a lot of work around here in the thoracic inlet to help that whole breathing in the thorax to relax down. And when that happens, some of the signs of that, there is a softening of the tissue in the back right along here. I will feel that all radiating into that. And uh, I'm not in a hurry, if you can tell. Just hang out with the body. And every body is different. That may sound like a truism, but it is the truth that when you're in this place of full attention to this particular body, person, that we're more than just bodies, um, when we are fully present there, we can support that in a way that allows the body to move into a relu rel more relaxed state. And so this is a place where I spend a lot of my therapeutic time uh, relaxing this whole complex because it is part of the breath mechanism that, in, that, in, that allows oxygen get deeper into cells and it affects the central nervous system in the brain, all of that. So uh, or this brachial plexus is really important to that. The next, the organization of it, I'll quickly go through this, this is kind of technical, but there are some front nerves. There's a very thin, narrow passage that muscles and nerves can pass through here, and this is often a place of impingement. So um, if, you, if you get tight in here, relaxing that down can be really helpful to reducing the tension all through that branching of nerves in the arm. So there's some in the front, uh, the orange ones in the picture. Um, the green one is the back and goes through the back. If you'll have pain right here sometimes, that's that back nerve uh, and it goes to the ulnar side. So I'll, I'll just go down and show you where they go in the arm. This is just to give you, and these will be online, right? Mm -hmm. The slideshow. So it'll give you a landscape on if you're experiencing pain, where in your body it is, it will give you a hint on what nerves are involved along the spinal column, so, which is part of the central nervous system. This dot slide shows the skin and where you may feel that in the skin. So if you lose sensation and it feels like um, you don't have the sensation, and there's something in the way, that's um, how it affects the skin layer. 
not the muscular underneath it, but the skin on the surface of things. And sometimes it may be a burning sensation. Sometimes it may be uh, um, just a loss of tingling on the skin level. Any questions about that? Well, uh, coincidentally, yes. I had a, an assignment, and I found out about this is only somewhat related, or maybe it's not. So we can it. Um, the little girl that was in the 1972 photograph in Vietnam who was hit by napalm had yep. a terrible Where she's walking down the street. And, yeah. and I didn't know the rest of the story until recently, and I, I made a, a, Go ahead. a thing on it. So she has, even these years, which is how many years later, 40, um, she's, she's getting uh, treatments for the, you showed up there in the previous slide, a, a cross-section of the skin. And it, at a certain depth, they now have laser treatments that treat into just that depth. The treatment itself is painful, but it's, it's, it's progress and it does work. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how these, uh, these nerves <coughs> relate to burns having a special, unique, uh, it's, a, it's a special affliction and uh, with the, dealing with the pain. And yeah. There are organs in the level of the skin they call them organelles <coughs> with sensation. And uh, at, at the base of every hair follicle, you have a organelle that is involved with that. And some of them get the fine motor where you get a pinprick and you feel the pinprick. Others are organ organs in the skin that sense pressure and heat and cold. So yeah, so she gets specific treatment for that part of her skin. Right. And I, I didn't know that, uh, you know, I don't have that type of neuropathy. And I'm uh, always amazed at the variety of uh, different experiences that uh, come to the group. So. Okay. The other one in lumbar, <clears throat> those are the two big ones, the um, brachial plexus and the lumbar plexus. Uh, with the skin, there's a similar um, <coughs> distribution both in the front and the back for the nerves. So let's look at this one over here. And if you've got this kind of pain that wraps around in the big toe and underneath, that would be from the femoral nerve as it branches out and goes down the inside of the leg into the feet. The, uh, is there another slide? Yeah, this one shows, for example, if it goes to the front part of the feet, and it is the tibial nerve that branches out and goes, the tibia right here, and branches out and hits the top part of the foot. So if that's where your pain is, that's where the branching is coming from uh, for that. And it also tells me something about how to treat as a massage therapist. When you say, this is where my pain is, I'm connecting with the nerves that are involved and addressing that up the chain in the central nervous system to the peripheral nerves in the spine. So I may hold the nerve root at your shoulder if you've got hand uh, pain in your hand and just let those connect with each other and relax down and just let that all kind of go from super hyper alert uh, down to a, a less painful situation. Okay? This is where on the skin and you'll notice there's no face because that nerve is in your brain, the facial nerve. And so there's a branching the, um, trigeminal and the facial nerve are in the, inside the cavity of the brain. And so that's not part of the peripheral nervous system. But the other parts kind of collect, just like you'd think, along C4, 5, 6, 7, up to T1, which is that little knot bump that is prominent at the base of your neck that's T1, 
and the other set are right here at the sacral bone. And the sacral bone, that <coughs> bone is really made up of six separate bones that got fused together. But, uh, uh, and that connects with T4-5 at the base of the spine. There, there are still nerves going through that part of the skeleton and through the spinal, spinal column. What um, happens when that's infused from back surgery? Good question. Um, the fusion can stabilize. I have several clients that I treat who have had laminectomies in L345. Um, there is usually not the motion of the spinal column the way you would normally experience. And so I, com I make adaptations around that, that complex when I'm releasing the, the, the abdominal and the pelvic uh, mm -hmm. floor. So yeah, it does make a difference. Sometimes there's, some people have a, 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 a loss of sensation in there and sometimes I have one who it's, it appears that the nerve got nicked and so there's a loss of sensation in that part of the pelvic bowl for, for that person. So, but as a massage therapist, working together with the medical profession around the issues that someone presents is really important. So, I, I try to get a, um, a doctor's authorization for massage so we're together as uh, healthcare practitioners, and uh, so that really does help all of us to be on the same page with that. The, does the thoracic area of the spine have anything to do? Yeah, the thoracic area has more, that's more connected with the organs mm -hmm. inside. There are some nerve endings that have the muscles of the ribs and that expansion. But a lot of them address the organs inside the body. Any questions about that or comments? Okay. Um, and it's more with the central nervous system too. Mm -hmm. uh, the vagus nerve will come down and go all the way down to the base of the pelvis, and it touches every organ. There's a lot. There are five times the neurons in our guts that send messages as there are in our brains that. So think about that, how active the gut is in terms of what we're experiencing um, neurologically. You're talking about um, neuropathy with the skin. Can it change the uh, texture and the look of the skin if you have? Oh, that explains so much. Can be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that tells me a lot as I touch the skin, is when I um, do hand or foot massages in the infusion rooms, I can sense the quality of the uh, skin tone when I, and I have gloves on, I'm, I'm gloved, but I can still sense uh, what the quality of the skin is when I touch it. And I'll make modifications to my massage as a result of that. Jerry, did you have any comments about that in your experience, which is more um, than mine? No, but I know that I always ask uh, patients first or clients first if they have any pain in their feet or hands before I even touch. And I look at the integrity of the skin. So that's all really important. Yep. Okay. Question two. How does it affect you generally and how is neuropathy affecting you today? And these questions are really all before you ever do massage. Jerry made a very good point. Uh, you're making a massage plan together. And so before you just presume to touch, you talk about where's your uh, pain and your neuropathy, where, and how does it affect you generally uh, in the quality of your life. If someone has neuropathy but is, uh, it's minimal and they're active, that's different than someone who has deep pain and they're not able to move around at all or very little. Uh, so how does it affect their social, their lifestyle, their mental and nutritional and environmental factors as well? Consider those 
all as part of how it's affecting you. Uh, and those change from day to day. So you ask a second question, how is your neuropathy affecting you today? Uh, it ebbs and it flows. Uh, okay. The massage begins gently with pressure, with m minimal pressure and slow movements. I remember Tracy saying half the speed um, and half the pressure and just uh, go very slow. Um, I always have the image of a sloth moving on a branch as I'm doing massage mm -hmm. and how he grabs and moves. So that kind of motion is what I envision as I'm doing my own massage practice. Not, you know, that can Is that why Tai Chi is good for neuropathy? Yes, Tai Chi. Uh, we're going to get into, and I'm watching the clock, we're going to uh, talk about a holistic approach to pain, chronic pain, and living with it, uh, and Tai Chi, mindfulness activities, um, connecting body-mind exercises, but then also nutrition and uh, social interaction. This is a big pain reducer. Pain grows in isolation. So if we mm -hmm. isolate ourselves from each other, our pain will become more and more chronic and keep us from addressing that as um, someone who lives with it. Okay. So here are the five levels of pain, or of uh, pressure, that the Walton Massage Therapy Pressure Scale. Uh, Tracy, when I, uh, went through massage school, it was contraindicated to do uh, massage with persons who had cancer. Um, it, they just said, you don't want to circulate the blood, so you don't want to cause any shedding of cells that may dislodge from the tumor or any place in the body. So everyone just kind of went, okay. Uh, but Tracy asked the question, what kind of massage can we do that is still medically indicated. And so she came up with the five levels, and the first one is lotioning. And lotioning is basically rubbing above the surface of the skin. You're not even indenting in the skin. So it's very light pressure, and you move slowly across the skin. Um, in fact, there's one above this, which is called holding, and all that is is basically just supporting and just letting that body move however it wants to and supporting it. And just that holding can do a lot toward down-regulating the pain sensation. Okay, second level is where there's a slight indentation in the skin and as you move, you just lightly indent. The third level is medium pressure and that pushes in a little bit. You're getting into the muscle belly a little bit, uh, the muscles that run along the spine in this picture. This fourth one is you're starting to push in and real hard. It's not indicated to do anything like these deeper pressures uh, with the yeah, oncology massage. Um, but the uh, first two are usually what I stay with in doing uh, an oncology massage. No. Neuropathy is usually just staying together with how's that for you, what's happening, and uh, keeping those things uh, in account. And that this is deep pressure where you're really pushing in. And that's something uh, I only do with people who ask for it and are in perfect health. and. Uh, don't have any kind of contraindications. The third question is, what is the cause of your neuropathy? And this gives a, us an opportunity to discuss the medical conditions, such as HIV disease, diabetes, chemotherapy, or any other um, conditions that require adjustments to the massage. Fourth question, what's the condition of your skin? We've talked a little bit about that, and uh, if there's a loss of integrity, you would stay away from that area in a massage. 
um, so to avoid further injury or infection to the site. Um, it's an important part of a massage plan to make modifications when those conditions exist, uh, when there's a breakdown of skin. Uh, I have one woman who's 103 and I gave her a massage on Wednesday and she has some breakdown in certain parts of her feet and she walks with a crutch and uh, so I stay away from that area of her foot but I work upstream from that uh, and when I, I've been massaging her for about three years now, she was 99 when we began and uh, she had arthritis pain. Uh, and after two massages, she said, my pain went away. And I said, that's interesting. She said, uh, can you come back every other week? And so I've been doing that for the last three years. And she's been able to maintain uh, her lifestyle. Um, she doesn't move around a lot, but she's able to get up. She has five or six cats that she likes to feed. <laughs> <laughs> so she's uh, uh, really active inside her own home. But uh, I take note of the skin condition every time I go out there. I can see and I've made modifications uh, if the skin lacks integrity. Uh, how's your neuropathy treated? Uh, what kind of drugs are you on? I went to MD Anderson to learn about all the kinds of drugs that are used for different conditions. I'm not an expert in all of the details of that, but if someone tells me they're on a certain medication, I will research that to make sure that I'm not doing any further harm uh, with the work that I do. Um, Anti-seizure meds uh, or other drugs and what the response is to them. And this is not one of the five, but it's really the question you live with. Uh, what is your experience of your neuropathy? And that is an existential question uh, as much as it is a physiological question. How is this, a, how are you experiencing it? And one of the things about massage that helps pain is that it goes down to the heart of where we live with our pain. There's an overall sense of well-being one can get from the massage approach and that stress response in the body that's associated with pain, such as elevated cortisol, are reduced through massage. Uh, for those reasons, massage can be used to treat many different kinds of pain, says Tri Tiffany Fields. She developed, uh, she started the Touch Research Institute in Florida. And uh, she says, basically, we have found massage to be effective in chronic pain syndromes and arthritis and diabetes and depressive disorders, such as ones that involve addiction, like eating disorders, in chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and other autoimmune disorders. HIV-associated diseases, too. So we have yet, we have looked at the A to Z of medical conditions, and we have not have found have not found a single condition massage has not been effective for. It's quite a claim that um, Hippocrates said, first do no harm. Uh, massage is a wonderful way to touch in a way that does no further harm. Hippocrates said it's more important to know what kind of a person has the disease than to know what kind of disease a person has. So pain will ask us, who are you? Who are you now? Uh, who are you now? And it's a moment by moment thing. So neuro neuropathic pain is personal. Um, I would not presume to, to claim to understand your pain but it's your personal uh, experience. It's also real. I, had, uh, I have a woman with uh, pelvic pain uh, as part, aggravated by irritable bowel syndrome and other conditions of the digestive tract. And when I s looked at her in the eyes and I said, your pain is real, she's teared up. Uh, 
just to hear that, to be told this is not, you're not making this up, it's real. Um, for years, fibromyalgia was a condition that doctors didn't know how to treat, didn't know how to cure. And a lot of uh, doctors, because they can't succeed with the management of that pain, said, well, it's maybe just make, it's psychosomatic, you're making it up. Uh, what they've since discovered, there is a very real physiological base to the fibromyalgia and that branching of all those nerves and the result of um, day by day having to live with that experience. So it's real. Pain is protective. And when we want to protect, we do one of two things. Or protect. So it's the fight or flight mechanism in our deepest brain when we experience that pain it's sometimes people in pain will act really strange like almost you know get away from me that is that deep brain limbic system protecting uh, or they pull into a shell and they hide their pain oh, I'm okay so that will cope that way um, neither one uh, pain is there to um, protect us, to say, oops, stay away from the fire. But it's also complex. And so this is where Dr. Frickton in the University of Minnesota began to understand how to respond to pain. Um, he has seven areas, uh, the body-mind aspects, and for me, I took his class in January online, and he had one hint uh, to keep from chronic pain in the jaw, and there's tightness in all this, getting migraine headaches. Uh, he suggested relaxing the lower jaw and always keeping your tongue between your two rows of teeth, the uppers and the lowers. And I've done that this year, and the amount of tension that I experience in this part of my skull has gone down considerably. And if I find myself tight, I'll look at where my jaw is and whether my tongue is separating the two teeth rows. And uh, just that little exercise for me, uh, that little thing has reduced this kind of neck and head tension for me uh, in the course of this past year. Uh, body and mind are linked. Um, I work with a number of therapists uh, next week I'll be going to New Mexico to a uh, clinic to learn uh, how to address trauma and body work for trauma release for persons who have gone through trauma, whether traumatic brain injury or PTSD, things I work with veterans as a volunteer as well. Um, and we will sometimes have two or three or sometimes four therapists on one body, one person, at the massage table, just supporting them, moving however they want to go. And in the course of a day's time with six hours, we, we have seen some dramatic changes in the way the body responds and the person experiences their own pain and trauma. And at the end of the day, we all got around in a circle and said, uh, what is it that caused this? What technique did we use that resulted in such a profound change? And uh, we kind of just decided it's all of the above. Um, that a person's body and mind are linked and it's hard to know where the body ends and the mind begins after a while. Um, especially when one comes from a place within oneself in the practice of it, where it comes from heart presence uh, there is a qualitatively different um, feel when um, I just had a flashback to one of my hospice patients. Um, in Christopher House, he was at the end of his life. He was 26 years old and had brain surgery or, to remove a tumor. And just before he passed, um, I looked in his eyes for about a half hour and he had trouble breathing. Whenever he'd cough, his whole right side of his head would turn red, deep red. And so I just held 
right here at his thoracic inlet, and we stared at each other for a half hour. There's something profound that happens in that experience that I cannot put into words for you, but it is a communication, um, very deep communication. I call it spirit to spirit. That just happens when we're in this place together, um, and it's bigger than both of us. So. Um, that's what I'm pointing to this morning, that having that in your experience makes a big, big difference with your experience of pain. It will affect your lifestyle, your emotions, as I just demonstrated. Uh, society, we are linked together. We are not uh, isolated, and we connect at the level of spirit, and it changes as we change our behavior too. And it may, if we look at our environmental factors, what are, what's in our environment that may be contributing to our stress? Um, maybe someone has neuropathy and is an executive of a corporation and is spending three weeks out of the month traveling by air and being repressurized and depressurized in airplanes, uh, that environment is gonna affect his experience of his own neuropathy or her neuropathy. This next slide was in the course and talks about the onset of pain. Way back here, we all live with a baseline of certain level of stress that's way over by that left-hand side but let's say we experience a strain or an injury or a trauma, uh, a disease, and there is pain that comes with that onset. The first six months after that are considered the acute phase of the body's and the person's response to that. And what happens is the muscles tense, the postures, uh, postural habits, and behavioral habits all set in in response to the pain. If nothing happens to change this pattern, it progresses to disrupt sleep. Does anybody have disruption of sleep with the pain? Yeah. Anxiety and stress. Um, I went through a period in my life in the late 80s where I was unable to get sleep and I could really tell it was after about four months and I started to get sleep deprived and believe me it really changes the way you respond to the pain um, there's what sets in after 10 months is there's depression disability social factors all those kind of start building and pain may become intractable um, when we do uh, pain management and hospice, uh, the most important is to address the pain and to move it back from an intractable to a less traumatic response. And so how do we do that? Well, here's an image of Graham Wilson as a uh, cartoon drawer. He drew a risk factors such as chronic stress may occur in recursive feedback cycles that can lead to the perpetuation and amplification of pain. This guy is in the middle of typing a letter, dear sirs, I am unhappy with your, and his typewriter goes out and starts on fire, and the <coughs> coffee is squirted on his arm, that hot coffee, and the toast is popping out, the wallpaper's peeling off, there's a piece of toast on the ceiling, and the clock, the cuckoo is clocking, is, is clucking, and time is moving on, and everything gets compressed, and that's a picture of stress. And if you get in that kind of feedback loop, if you get in that kind of feedback loop, um, the bad news is the brain has a way of what you uh, get locked into begins to set up a recursive feedback loop neurologically. And so it elevates uh, more and more. Um, the, the good news is that 
what you wire together fires together. So this can lead to a chronic pain pattern. But if you start to address those protective factors of the, all those areas, nutrition, uh, mastering the stress, Tai Chi, uh, it's not an accident that those mindful activities are part of your um, neuropathy group's activities. Um, play, um, that's a big one for me. I've uh, begun to learn to play. We've had our grandson living or staying with us since last Tuesday and kids know how to play automatically and it just brings me brings us into this playfulness and when did we lose that in our lives um, but the good news is that what you wire together fires together and so comprehensive self-care may occur in recursive feedback cycles as well that lead to the amelioration and alleviation of pain so this is James Frickton's favorite quote from uh, Hippocrates, divine is the task to relieve pain. So. Okay, any questions, comments? Um, yes? I have a comment that I still don't understand. Um, I'll be in a group of people and I'll be feeling this pain and people will say, but you look great. I've had neuropathy for seven years. It hadn't gotten better, but I've gotten better. And I didn't understand what he meant. And now I do. It's all about me and how I see it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying that. And I've heard it. We've all heard it. One out of 15 people have neuropathy. I, I'm trying to get the word out happened to meet the mayor, told him if there's anything I could use for class, you know, you're about just get people to understand. I mean you can't tell just by looking. You can hide it. I relieve the pain by sitting. I don't look like I'm in pain. But you know And if you tell somebody you feel guilty sometimes because yeah. it's almost like you're making an excuse and they're thinking, you don't have pain. You're standing there. You can do that. And I have a lot of guilt because, and that sounds weird, but I have a lot of guilt feelings about it. I can understand that, it's for sure, but yeah. others won't. They yeah. don't see it. You can't see what's going on yeah. in your mind. Yeah. It's just the pain's interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are some sheets that I put in the handout. Um, they have, there's a chart there, and uh, <clears throat> it kind of points to something you may want to take a look at, and you'll notice the chart for the seven realms chart of risk and protective factors. Um, the seven areas that Dr. Frickton points out um, make an anagram that says bless me b-l-e-s-s-m-e -S -S -E. and so the first one is the body and finding a balanced relaxed posture for you uh, protective factors practicing the full range of motion uh, endurance strength relaxed muscles and joints genetic protective factors and moderation to prevent injury so giving yourself permission not to have to dance all night <laughs> and say, you know, I'm going to care for myself. I will be out there a little bit, but uh, I'm going to care for myself. Risk factors, tense, unbalanced posture. Uh, and it's funny, if you work at a computer, you will not consciously realize it, but gradually you will do this as you look at your computer monitor. <laughs> And what that's doing, just imagine this brachial plexus here, of what that's doing to that brachial plexus. It's going to pinch that. The, uh, and learning to bring to consciousness and balance that is really important. So um, risk factors, comorbidities, obesity, genetic risk, um, acute injury. Some of the actions to follow to reduce the risk of chronic pain are good posture, head up, shoulders back, tongue 
And usually the rule is ears over shoulders, over uh, hip, over ankles. Um, I'm nowhere close to that. I think. <laughs> um, once we're over five years old, I think we, we lose that. Just uh, my observation that we, we make compensations. And that's another thing. If you compensate around an injury, that's okay. Um, the woman who's 103, she's like this and like this. I'm not going to, as a massage therapist, I'm not going to try to straighten that out. That's not my goal as her massage therapist. My goal is to help her live with her life and to be as pain free as she can. <coughs> so I'm not doing what I think in my head she needs. This is a big shift. I am there attending to what her intelligence is telling me she needs and being with that as fully as I can. That's a very different way to practice and I'm glad I've discovered that way because it takes the pressure off of me to be the fix-it guy uh, and I can be fully present with someone. Okay, and then actions to avoid, slouching, no overstretching, uh, too much activities, uh, too much, too fast, too painful, too, <coughs> too, 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 um, or inactivity, <coughs> except for fractures and tears. <coughs> the lifestyle faction, uh, actions, uh, emotions, Feelings and affect, we haven't talked much about depression and pain, but it's a real reality. Um, learning to live um, in rewiring some of the activities to go down a different street. You heard the one about the uh, patient who goes to the doctor and uh, he says, doctor, it hurts when I do that. And the doctor says, don't do that. Um, well. Society. All right. I wish I could. If I could, I would. Um, society, people, and relationships that harmony, bringing together in a group is a big part of it. So you've got a head start here. Spirit, purpose, beliefs, self compassion, self esteem. Um, define what your purpose is. Um, and what brings meaning and purpose, and move in that direction. Uh, for me, that was a big one in my life. Uh, mind, cognition, and thoughts. What I tell myself really goes a long way toward outcomes. And finally, environment, nature, surroundings. I can uh, relax a whole lot more in a, a nice, warm field in the sunshine than I could at the corner of uh, I-35. and and MLK. Dr. Frickton gives his example of how he did that in his own life and so I printed his out as a good example of uh, and he basically said I love the feeling after and he applied it to each of those seven areas. So in my body I love the feeling after I go for a brisk walk or run in the morning. Um, or um, I maintain a balanced, relaxed posture all day, including while I'm driving. Um, so I love the feeling after, and then complete those sentences for yourself. See what uh, that leads you to, and what makes you feel good. And the final one is a chart. Uh, I'm glad to hear there's a nurse who uh, charts your progress. It would be interesting to use this chart on the back page, Pain and Headache Weekly Diary, uh, with you and or your health professional. Where is the pain? How long does pain last? How severe is it? Um, what medications are you taking? How about triggers from the chart that lead to pain? Risk factors that you're doing at the time, and then protective factors that you're doing in that given day. And then this, you can photocopy this for a week's worth of charting and see what happens over a number of weeks for yourself. I know I've gone quickly through it, but uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm really glad to have been here. Thank you.